evening everyone we are about to begin the session request everyone to settle down please uh, i am gorav shishodia from invest india and i'll be moderating today's session uh, which is focused on fmcg employment and investment catalyst for india's economic growth today we have an eminent panel which will share uh, the views on the specified topic of employment and investment in fmcg creating a growth for the economy for this i would like to invite uh, mr hemant malik ceo food business itc <laughs> mr jagrit kotecha ceo pepsico india and south asia mr manish anandani ceo kenview india mr prashant peris md india and south asia kelanova and mr jeevaraj pillai president uh, uflex limited so as you all may know that fmcg sector contributes about 30% of the total retail market in india and is also a major contributor towards employment creating 3 million jobs directly the sector has also been growing at a cagr of about 10% and with the eminent panelists today from companies like pepsico kenview uflex kelanova and itc we have leaders who are not only driving growth but also creating opportunities across the country to start the discussion i would like to discuss about innovation and employment opportunities in this sector and these are well known brands so i would just you know ask each of these leaders to give a brief introduction about them and their company so that everybody is aware of what they've been doing so if uh, would request him and you to start with and quickly come up in a minute um, a very good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh, it's a delight to be here at this world food india i think uh, we uh, i have not had a chance to go and see the stalls but uh, in the meetings that have been happening and in the inauguration that was quite exciting and you are so happy to see what food can do food processing can do for this country uh, i represent itc foods uh, we are a 20 year old startup uh, from bangalore uh, we were zero at once about 20 years back uh, today we are one of the largest uh, packaged food company uh, we play uh, in uh, across many categories we have a big brand called ashirwad on the staples category we also up off from atta spices salt we do that we have got biscuits uh, a full range of biscuit portfolio we have uh, snacks which is where we uh, compete with pepsi a little bit they are the big people we are small players uh, uh, we have a juice portfolio we have a noodles portfolio so we we we, we are a late entrant into this food space uh, we competing with big multinationals uh, but i think uh, being an indian company with consumer insights and knowledge uh i think we have done pretty okay so thank you uh, for inviting me got up here hello good afternoon everyone and uh, my name is jagrut uh, and i have the privilege and honor to lead the pepsico company in uh, india and south asia uh, well we have we are competing but we are friendly competitors uh we are a very much indian company do our it's a global pepsico but we are here for more than 30 years uh, i've been with the company for 30 years the company was before that uh and uh, honestly uh, if i have to say we are a very agriculture based company i mean our name tells us pepsico beverage but let me share some secret uh we also sell food and we sell great food products um, i'm sure everyone has tried uh, lays potato chips uh, kurkure uh, and quaker doritos cheetos and i could keep uh, Uh, adding to it and as being part of the food company we work very closely with farmers uh, we have we almost work with 27000 farmers uh, not many one many of you know and we work in almost gujarat west bengal uh, uh, mp mp rajasthan so wo dharti ya zameen ke judi hui company hai that's what we are very much indian but yeah dil hai hindustani <laughs> All right. Hi. Le- hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Manish Anandani. I uh, I'm part of a Kenview India. 
uh, and South Asia. Most of the people may not know in this room what Kenview is. Like Hemant met me and he said, hey, Kenview Kai. Uh, so just uh, when I talk about Kenview, uh, Hemant said that he's a 20 year old startup. We call ourselves a one year old startup with a 135 year old brands. And why we say that is because um, you must have heard about our brand. So we have three segments. Uh, essential health, we have brands like Johnson's Baby, uh, Stay Free, and Listrin. Uh, we have a sec second segment called Skin Health and Beauty, where we have brands like Neutrogena, uh, Avino, uh, and Clean and Clear. Uh, and then we have a third brand, uh, segment called Self Care, uh, where we have brands like Orsil, which is a pr proud partner of Hydration for uh, World Food India. And we also have brands like Benadryl uh, and many other self-care brands, right? So this is why we call ourselves a one-year-old startup with a 135-year-old brand. Uh, and we are in India from 1947. So we are a very old organization in India and we're really proud to be part of India's growth story uh, as we are all seeing uh, through, through and through. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Really happy to be here. It's always inspiring to come to World Food India because you see the level of innovation uh, and the level of enthusiasm for processed foods, uh, which is absolutely uh, energizing. Uh, my name is Prashant Peris. I am the MD for Kellanova, previously known as Kellogg's, and that's how you all will know the organization. Uh, I always describe Kellogg's as the original plant-based nutrition company. Uh, a lot of people talk about this as something very new, but I think uh, Mr. Kellogg's got onto this space a long, long time back, more than 116 years ago. Uh, we are the ones who have pioneered the breakfast cereal category in India with brands like Chocos, Kellogg's Conflicts, of course, and in the more recent past, we've been building mueslis and granolas in India, which are doing very well. Uh, we really believe in this combination of taste and health, uh, and naturally, when you give both of them to the mother uh, at a time when she needs convenience the most, we believe it's a very potent uh, proposition. So that's what we've been doing. But we are not just breakfast cereal. We are also a snacking company. Uh, we have many big snacking brands uh, globally, but the one that you all would have probably heard of in India is Pringles. It's one that we brought into India much more recently, uh, and we hope to get more in, in the times to come. Thank you. Uh, very good afternoon. I am Jeevraj Pillai. I am the odd man out. Uh, so I am from packaging. So uh, I am the president of the packaging vertical and the whole time director in Uflex. Uflex is a packaging Indian MNC in packaging. So we have a, basically an Indian company with global footprint. Uh, we are a one stop shop. We make uh, everything in packaging right from films to packaging material to engineering machines for packing. Um, so I'm happy to be here. Thanks uh, World Food India to have invited us and uh, happy to contribute to this uh, panel discussion. Thank you so much for the introductions. And to start the discussion with the theme of innovation and employment, I think we'll start with a startup which was set up 20 years back, but have grown such big that, you know, uh, it's almost into all the segments and new segments coming up every time, including IDC MasterChef, which we all love. So uh, coming to ITC, uh, ITC has been a classic example of how companies can innovate in new business models to generate more economic value. Since you've been working from farmers to you know processing to re retail, all of that. So how is ITC leveraging innovation across its diverse business verticals to generate employment opportunities, especially in rural areas? I, I ask this question because also of the ITC master chef model. It is a very unique one which you started. So if you'd like to shed some light, light on that. Um, you know, when you put a question on innovation, it's a very, very uh, large question in the sense that one can keep on going on. Uh, because as a, as a late entrant in every category, the only way you can win, the only right to win is if you can come with something new. If you come with a product which is already in the market and you try to sell because you're cheaper, you, don't, you can't go long, long, wrong, long rather. So uh, that has been the philosophy. We, when we, you know, we, we customize our products, we spend a lot of time understanding the consumer and building a consumer proposition. When we launched ATA, we have a different ATA for the North, for the West, for the South, for the East. 
uh, as we became bigger, we realized we need different data for Rajasthan and, and different for UP because that's how the consumer expectations and, and challenges are. Uh, when we got into the noodles business, we were competing with one of the largest brands and we came up with the idea of uh, round noodles because we found the children want long noodles, but if you break the noodle, the, all, the, all the pans are round. So the only way you cannot break the noodle is putting a round block onto it. Uh, so that's the kind of thinking that you have to put in anything that we do. Uh, our, our Sunfeast uh, Dark Fantasy is the first Choco Phil Biscuits. Very recently, um, you know, I, I think there are so many categories, I will not cover all of them. Uh, very recently, we have launched a, a brand for 40 plus because we believe that, uh, uh, you know, there is always, all brands keep on coming for youth, targeting youth. Uh, but there is no brand which is looking at the needs of people as they grow a little older and remain young in their mind, mindset, you know, I'm 58, but I don't feel like that any. Uh, but the body changes, right? Whether you like it or not, there will be an impact on your gut, on your uh, requirement of energy and stamina. And we have launched a brand called Right Shift. Uh, the portfolio is the same portfolio, but designed for people who are 40 and above. And, you know, if any of you, I don't see anybody who looks 40 and above, uh, <laughs> but they are. So you please, no, no, I know you don't look. That's what I'm saying, you know, uh, but, but, you're, but you know. So please go and uh, check out uh, uh, the, the stall on stall number 14. Uh, coming from a, a rural part of uh, response, I think uh, we are an agri company. Uh, we are one of the largest. Uh, uh, we are the second largest buyer of wheat in the country after Food Corporation of India. And that means that we have to work very closely with the farmers and some of the challenges that are coming for particularly both agri and therefore food processing is this whole impact of climate. And, and climate, uh, and, and, and it has suddenly thrown the supply chains out of gear. Uh, but you know, you, what you can probably control is try and understand. So we are doing climate modeling across all the growth regions, right? Uh, so we have, you know, and, and through climate modeling, we are able to identify which are the areas. And so that is one where you can actually look at growing. Second is what kind of uh, recently government of India also released certain uh, seeds, uh, which could be more climate resistance. So how do we work with the farmers to make sure that climate resistance seeds could be there? A uh, third area that we work on is we have set up a very large network. And this is coming from, you know, your question on rural employment is we have a, uh, uh, some of you might have heard of each Opal, which we had set about 20 years back. Uh, now it's all digital, it's all digitized. And we have launched uh, this ITC Mars, uh, which is a digital solution accessible to phones of uh, all the farmers. And we have already have about a 1,500 FPOs on board, which means more than 200,000 farmers uh, connected. And we support them with in terms of quality of, uh, you know, you can just post a picture and all, uh, the, the uh, algo will tell you what, what you need to do, uh, you know, for your better productivity. At the same time, we've also decided that all the new locations that we invest in, uh, of course, we, many states are giving incentives, uh, uh, but most of them are in rural areas. So that allows for, you know, employment generation in, in, in those areas. Uh, but it's a, it's a large opportunity as far as food processing is concerned. In India, only about 10, 12 percent is uh, processed food. Uh, but I think, you know, with the energy that, you know, Prashant mentioned that you see, I think there's a great potential going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Hemanji. And you rightly said that there's a specific focus on supply chain in the agri-food sector that needs to be addressed. And so that's why I turn to Mr. Jagrut Kotecha on how do you think that the food and beverage industry is expected to transform with a specific focus on supply chain and innovation? I'm a con I'm a, I sell finished products and market that. Now you're asking me supply chain, but let me give, give it a shot. Uh, listen, as, as today and the next four days forum is about uh, food processing, huge opportunity. Our Prime Minister has laid down a very clear vision. Today the Honourable Minister Piyush Goel spoke about it, Honourable Minister Chirag Paswan and rest spoke about it. So, and genuinely, India could be that powerhouse uh, for, for food processing uh, and uh, now, uh, to be that, yes, there are challenges and there are opportunities. Every challenge, one translates into opportunities. And I think the government is, and many of us are working towards that in partnership to do that. A few examples, right? Uh, the whole pro program about quick clearances, about end-to-end -end for food processing industry, so you can holistically set it up. I think that's one. Uh, the second one is about today we heard, and we've been seeing that, cold chain infrastructure, because a lot of our food gets wasted. By the time it's picked out of the farm, to it comes even to the processing unit, forget the consumer, 
a huge percentage of that gets wasted. And setting up cold chains and cold stores are a brilliant idea. And uh, us players like us, uh, PepsiCo, uh, Pareto, as many of you know, is mainly one crop, and the other crop is very small. And hence, cold chain becomes important, and we've been working with partners, local partners, to uh, set up that integrated cold chain, which allows us the storability and keep giving us great products on lays, which keeps, keeps smiling on consumers' face. So cold chain is the other part of it. Uh, the third part, as logistics and infrastructure, there's so much of investment going on over there, including, uh, I believe, almost 40 food processing parks coming up uh, in, in the coming years. This, these are the things which will enable food processing to even grow much faster. And all these parks, will, I'm, I'm sure, will come up with relevant new technologies, state of the art, where many companies will collaborate and uh, invest with, with the government to do that. Uh, the fourth, uh, the example which uh, Heyman spoke about, uh, using AI technology. There are fantastic, brilliant startups which are happening, uh, which can take footprints of farms. Uh, like, like Heyman mentioned, we, when we work with 27,000 farmers, over the last two years we've started working with local players where you can educate farmers well in advance uh, within that one by one acre plot through satellite. Uh, the color codes on the plot tell you whether the farm has water deficiency and hence the drip irrigation needs to start. A color code will tell you is there an uh, issue on fertilizer which needs a little bit of fertilizer in that small plot of it. So in giving forward information to the farmers gives significant yields. Okay? So that's where, again, a lot of that will come together. So I think we're taking great steps in the right direction, and I'm pretty sure confident that digital innovation will help this industry grow multiple times. Thank you. And I now move to Mr. Manish Anandani. Uh, so since COVID hit, a lot of focus of consumers has shifted towards, you know, consumer health and health-based foods. So what are some of the emerging trends that you see in the consumer health segment where can we is focusing on? And what are the kind of investments that you see could come in this area for more promoting of investment and improving of accessibility to the Indian consumer? All right, so there are three questions. I'll, I'll try and attempt uh, one by one. So, uh, can view as a world's largest consumer health company by revenue, and uh, what we are seeing, one of the biggest trend is the health conscious consumer, uh, which is becoming the very big uh, trend across the globe, not only in India. And when I use the word health conscious, I mean like you're seeing uh, consumer becoming much more aware of the health needs and trying to do things which are preventive in nature rather than reactive in nature, right? So for example, in India also in 2022, the number of days the heat wave was there was about 220 days, right? I mean, that's a lot number of days in a year for a heat wave to happen. And there are a lot of people who actually lost their life because of the heat wave. And uh, uh, it's very important for uh, manufacturers like ourselves and many others to continue to educate the consumers about the health needs for them to take care of their own uh, health. And for, for that matter, Orcel, which is our uh, electrolyte drink, comes, plays a big role because Orcel is basically a scientifically uh, produced product which helps the uh, balance of uh, electrolyte fluid and electrolyte. So we call it FEE, fluid, electrolyte, and energy. Right? So that's how we are able to uh, educate the consumer. That's one trend. Second of the trend is, if you actually look at, and by the way, I must qualify that uh, out of the panel here, uh, other than the uh, gentleman on the right side, uh, we are the smallest part of the portfolio on the food. We have very large portfolio on the health side. Uh, but uh, the second trend which we are seeing is really about uh, the big urbanization is making a lot of changes, right? Because urbanization also comes at a cost, right? So there is much more pollution that has creating different kinds of uh, health uh, conditions, right? For example, in India now, um, one out of two babies born is born with sensitive skin, right? And that's really creating a need for educating the mothers to how to take care of the babies. And that's where our brand uh, Avino comes in because Avino Baby is really about how do we educate the mother about taking care of the uh, health needs of the baby. And the third thing which we are seeing is the health and hygiene, which is government is playing a lot of effort saying how do we become much more, uh, 
how do we educate the girl child? How do we make sure the health and hygiene of a girl child is very critical? And we have an iconic brand called Stay Free, which basically operates in uh, sanitary pads. And even in India today also, period as a conversation is a very, very taboo subject. It's not coming out in the open where uh, even the family members are not talking to the girl child about what the period is all about. And that's where we are playing a role of educating the uh, houses to really make sure that they talk about a period and we have a campaign called it's just a period to be able to educate the uh, consumer including the father and the brother not just the mother and the ch uh, girl child and so these are the few trends which we are seeing um, in terms of uh, accessibility right uh, you know the one of the most important thing in, in India is to make sure that uh, uh, you uh, make sure your products are available in such an easy way that there is no difficulty for consumers, specifically in the rural area. And each of all, as Heyman talked about, or uh, Pepsi's distribution, that really makes a big difference, specifically in the products where the need is very important. For example, Orsil. You need the product at the right place at the right time. If you're really having a heat stroke, for example, you need to replenish yourself. and. We're doing a lot of effort to make sure our product accessibility is all around, right? And the last is really about the investment, um, uh, which these two gentlemen also talked about. Uh, we, we, we are very proud to say that our 90% of our plus production is all in India, even though we are a multinational company, where you can see the supply chain is getting very much centralized, but we produce everything locally. Not only that, we are also making the investments in uh, R&D facility. So we have R&D facility in India, which not only provides support to India, but also to the globe, right? So we have created a global R&D center uh, locally. And also we have created a data and tech center uh, about three months back, which is in Bangalore, which is supporting the uh, global needs as well. Thank you. Uh, now I move to Mr. Prashant Perez. And since you are mostly dealing with cereals, how do you see the role of innovation in producing uh, these products, the kind of production techniques that you require to make more of palatable uh, you know, food products? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, you know, uh, in some ways, breakfast cereal itself uh, is a little bit of an innovation in India because we still sit at very low penetrations for our category. Uh, I think the way we look at innovation, and I want to just give you all a bit of perspective, uh, we've been around for almost 30 years in India and actually the globe, the center of excellence for innovation for the entire region of Africa, Middle East, Asia, Pacific actually is based out of India. So we're very proud about that because what it means is we've got the capabilities right here in India near our factories uh, to bring out some of the best innovations not just for India but for the larger region. When we look at innovation for India, I think there are two factors to it. One is, you know, consumers in India, and it's true almost everywhere in the world, but definitely in India, they never want to compromise on taste, right? So taste is paramount. They want health, but they want it in the form of a very tasty product. Uh, and that in, in its core is where the challenge for innovation comes in. So a lot of our products you will see, we've recently, let's say, got chocos with multigrain, which includes millets. Uh, no maida, but you've got to deliver the same taste that the kids love day in, day out. And that's a challenge and we've done that. Uh, and honestly, that's been considered a best-in-class product that actually is probably going to go as an innovation across the region. Uh, I'll give you another example of a category called muesli, yeah, where, you know, it's a category often mispronounced in India. People don't know the term, they can't produce, pronounce it, museli, they say all sorts of things about it and they don't know what that category is about. Uh, and I think we, we came upon the concept that Indians actually know concepts like this. We have this in our snacks. It's all about bringing the best of many things together, something like an all-in-one. And we put together what we called a 12-in-one power breakfast with six grains, including oats and barley, fruits, nuts and seeds. Now, putting all this together in one product consistently day in, day out, uh, that's an innovation in itself. It may sound simple, but it needs a back-end of exceedingly good suppliers who can work with you, who can deliver to international standards uh, and then put it together in, in the form of a, a food that the consumers love. 
very very successful uh, uh, launch and i can again say this is one idea that's got wings and is probably going to travel at the heart of it is very close uh, proximity and centricity with consumers you've got to understand what they want innovation need not always be complex it's sometimes simple things and simple ideas that can do well uh, and it's translated into a product in the in a value that the consumers can afford especially for a country like india uh, the thing i always tell my regional colleagues is if you crack an innovation in india it will probably work everywhere in the world because we work with very low uh, you know value thresholds as far as consumers are concerned they are value conscious and when you can deliver a good product at the pr kind of prices we do in india uh, we find that those kind of products are above everywhere uh, the other thing is you know while we do innovation we can never compromise on the product safety or the food quality uh, we benchmark you know some of our standardized products like conflicts which are there all over the world and we benchmark amazingly well you know we are considered best in class product in many cases and while this question was about innovation i also want to talk about this that raising the level and the standards not only of our practices our best practice best manufacturing practices in our factories but that of our suppliers as well to a standard where we can say listen this is as good as a product you could get in the us or japan is something that gives us great pride it gives us great pride when our suppliers also supply japan and australia so i think when we talk about food processing and india becoming part of the global food basket this is one area we should all look at as well uh, not only to help us innovate but innovate with really high quality products uh, that can be sold the world over yeah thank you thank you prashant and i think uh, strengthening the supply chain is a common theme that is coming around uh, coming out of this discussion as well so now moving from products to packaging and my question is to mr pillai uh, uh, since for packaging you need to innovate every day as a new product needs to come out based on the government regulations or the need of the customer so how is uflex driving innovation in packaging solutions for india's fmcg sector uh, thanks garo it's very interesting uh, to note that in the last 5 or 7 years packaging has completely been transformed you know from an uh, non recyclable component in packaging to more and more emphasis on using recyclable uh, materials there has been a big shift in the in the outlook not only the outlook but the the consumer demands and the way packaging and the brand owners look at it you know we all know we are in the middle of the epr you know epr is a, a regulation which uh, makes the producers uh, collect and not only collect but also to uh, obligate it by recycling and use of recycled content so these are the two key uh, main areas of the epr so as uh, producers of flexible packaging material we had to shift our focus in the last 5 years to manufacture uh, material in in line with the the epr requirements uh, most importantly we have been able to develop uh, packaging structures which uses uh, recycled content this is very important uh, we had lot of hurdles like recycle use of recycled content is regulated by fssi and uh, we did not have proper standards to define uh, the guidelines for use of recycled content in packaging uh, but uh, as far as the innovation is concerned the industry is ready with the solution all we are waiting for is uh, regulatory clearances uh, from uh, the government to allow the usage of recycled content but as an industry we have been able to invest innovate and uh, prepare ourselves to uh, meet this eventuality uh, the other area concerned area was uh, to remove non recyclable structures in the design of sustainable packaging structures uh, heterogeneous polymers uh, make the material very recyclable uh, non recyclable so we had a challenge in uh, replacing aluminum foil paper uh, in the composite laminate so this is something which we could successfully achieve because we manufacture our own raw materials we manufacture polypropylene films polyethylene films polyester films so we could innovate and develop solutions which uh, we are able to replace aluminum foil and paper in the composite laminate other than that um, uh, like in uh, beauty and uh, cosmetic industry we have recyclable tubes and caps we have developed uh, water based inks and adhesives for the brand owners uh, which are more eco friendly 
we have been able to share the technology of recycling multi-layer plastics with uh, brand owners. We're also working on a FOFO model where uh, we are encouraging small investment companies to come forward and invest in recycling where we share the technology with them. So these are some of the innovations uh, which have been done by us to help the brand owners, not only help the brand owners, to help ourselves also because the, the EPR stipulates all the PIBOs to be compliant to the EPR norms. Thank you, Gaurav. Thank you, and I understand that most of these, most of you have all, already been making a lot of investments to drive innovation. And also, when you set up your investments, you also not just cater to the domestic demand, but also to ex for exports, right? So, coming to the second round, where I also want to talk, touch upon exports, and I will start with Himanji. Uh, with ITC's growing presence in international markets and an Indian brand growing so well in uh, international markets, how do you see the potential for the export growth of Indian products, and how do you ensure global competitiveness? Um, I just want to make a couple of comments on, sure. and then I'll Please come sir. and answer the question. So first is in terms of, you had asked a question on terms of what are the trends that you're seeing from a health perspective. Uh, I would like to add a couple of points from uh, what we find at least two big areas that are coming in and this is based upon social listening, uh, the volume and you know the quantity of information that is already coming in. One is in terms of interest in protein. I find that what used to be seen very, very limited uh, five years back, I think it's becoming much more mainstream and therefore uh, that's what the consumer is looking for and it's a question in terms of how we as brand owners can solve and give solutions in, in different facets. Uh, the second big area that we are seeing is as far as gut health is concerned, right? And I think that is another big aspect which is coming in and therefore whether it is discussions on prebiotics, probiotics, symbiotics, a lot of that is happening and that's another uh, aspect that we are seeing and therefore again opportunity for food companies to actually look at these trends and see how they want to build it. The second comment I want to make is on, on, on technology and food processing, right? I think uh, sometimes we don't realize that, uh, you know, it looks as if it's very simple and I'll give two examples uh, and this is all recent examples. Uh, uh, we were getting into the basin business, right? And there are already a lot of package business in the basin in the market. And one consumer problem that we found was that when you're adding water and you're, you, know, you have to holo the basin before that, it would form knots. It's a simple thing, they're used to it, they'll say, no, no, don't worry, even if it happens, we just kind of press it in. He said, no, how do we solve that? What causes a knot? Right? And then you start looking at, is there any literature available around uh, chana and when you grind the chana and what happened? There is no literature available. So we had to, you know, go back into research, try to understand what is the particle size that actually causes uh, this, uh, you know, coagulation to take place. And today, Ashirvad Basin is a guarantee you can do it. It will not form, you know, any, any gant uh, onto it. And we've done a lot of demonstrations, so it's absolutely. The second thing is, this is a launch that we did last uh, 15 days back uh, in, in Calcutta. This is on, again, soya nuggets. Everybody eats soya nuggets, right? What is the difference that you can bring on soya nuggets? And uh, what we find is that, and you know, is that the most important thing is that has the masala got absorbed into it? Yeah. And for the masala to get absorbed into it, you need better quality pores. Now, how do you create that better quality pores? What is the science behind it? What is the kind of extrusion pressure that is required? What is the kind of source of soya that can make that difference? So it took us uh, a year and a half. Right, we thought it's an easy product that we will be able to do it, but I think that is something. So I'm just trying to say that there is a lot of work that can happen and, and differentiation can happen through uh, technology uh, as well. Uh, coming uh, uh, to your, uh, and, and of course a response to Mr. Pillay, all his innovation increases costs for us. So, <laughs> uh, um, uh, the, uh, coming to the exports bit, I think, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion on India, uh, opportunity, Indian food. Uh, Indian diaspora. And Indian diaspora actually is a fantastic opportunity because now, uh, and you know, in countries like the, the US has become, a, or even Australia or Canada and UK has been there in the past as well. Because when this diaspora is there, people are getting used and getting exposed to Indian products. If you go to a Patel Brothers store, you will now having a lot of other, uh, you know, the white also coming into and, and, and shopping uh, over there. So I think, uh, uh, and therefore Indian food opportunity to export. But I think the challenge that we do face uh, is in terms of supply chain. Uh, you know, sometimes there are some, uh, uh, you know, regulations that the government needs to put to keep the local interest, but it does impact the 
uh, you know, your supply chain because uh, you've planned a certain export business, but suddenly something needs to get banned export. Uh, and there may be genuine reason for it, but you know, uh, the consumer out there doesn't uh, uh, understand that. There is this role of building brand India in terms of how you can make sure that your uh, quality uh, comes in and therefore, uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, the, the innovation opportunity uh, always there. So for us, uh, US is a big market. We export uh, frozen food, we export uh, atta, we export, uh, you know, cookies, biscuits, and I think ready to eat Indian food is another big space that, that, that we are focusing on. Uh, but I think uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the opportunity there is, of course, you know, how well you can streamline the supply chain uh, to be present over there. Thank you for shedding light on, you know, how can brands work, maybe innovate or work more with various stakeholders and strengthen the supply chain to create more exports. Uh, moving on to PepsiCo, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Kodecha, how do you think today's consumer is driving investment decision in PepsiCo? And like you've been launching new products because of the demand that is being created. And is there a market shift uh, from the earlier trends? Uh, you mean not PepsiCo stocks, PepsiCo products. I'm yes, going products. just to clarify that. <laughs> uh, I think some of the consumer trends, uh, both my colleagues over here talked about it. Uh, so PepsiCo, it's a great marketing company. It also produces fantastic products. But all of that is the fundamental DNA of it is being a consumer-centric organization. Uh, we play consumers at the heart of it. So any innovation we do, like Heyman spoke about, a lot of time, energy, and effort goes into that as to why we are doing it and whom are we trying to address. Uh, we have global brands, but our innovations are very local. Okay? For example, Lay's uh, our flavors, I mean, we have masala flavor, we have classic salted, okay? Uh, uh, we have the spice, spice buckets over there, and we also have international flavors, okay? Uh, the same thing on kurkure, which is a home-grown Indian brand with regional flavors and mixes like that. And we have Doritos, we have nacho cheese, which is a world-famous uh, product, but, but we also have local variants. The reason we do that is because every consumer is different in every market, and even in India. Why every, con I mean, our taste bud changes every 250, 300 kilometers. Uh, a masala in Gujarat and Western India will be a sweet masala. If you go to Northern India, it will be more a whole rounded masala. If you go to the Southern part of India, it will be spice, right? But it's all in the brackets of masala. So being consumer centric and understanding it's the cue. And some of what's happening with the consumers in India, listen, uh, over the last few years, uh, and also the way our Prime Minister has laid the vision out to be the third largest economy, the GDP is going to keep growing, uh, the disposable income as a result will keep expanding, and consumers will make choices, uh, and they will look for choices, because um, internet penetration is almost 100%, uh, smartphones are almost 700 to 800 million users, so consumers are getting aware, and hence wanting to expire experiment and get differential experiences. So I believe that's the beauty which will help the food processing industry overall, uh, because that will lead to innovations because the consumer is gonna start experimenting. At the same time, the disposable income to indulge, to have some fun, to, you know, we all need to relax and uh, indulge ourselves from time to time. Experimentation helps. So that's one of the trends. Having said, India is going to be always an and story. It will never be or. And what do I mean by and? Value and value and mass consumers will always be there. You cannot uh, have growth without that. You cannot lose sight of that. But and, there's also an opportunity of premiumization and driving value. Because there are different, the value equation is not just price. The value equation is experience, the product, how it makes me feel, and then am I giving a reasonably good price for that? That's the whole, and at those both strata, uh, there are different consumers. So I think it will be an opportunity, and we are seeing more and more of that happening. Uh, along with mass, premiumization also is growing as disposable incomes are coming. So that's one big trend. The second is uh, convenience will become big. Uh, we are all getting busier by the day. Uh, traffic doesn't help us much, uh, and uh, we want convenience. And quick calm uh, is is booming like hell. 
It's broken the barriers of traditional go-to-market. Ten years ago, nobody would have thought about it. Uh, in fact, India leads the Quickcom. I mean, I've seen many markets. I believe India leads one of the Quickcom evolutions. Even U.S. is still not there. I think it's catching up. Europe is catching up. But the evolution which has happened, I mean, 15-minute delivery, I don't remember traveling around the world where I've seen 15-minute delivery, right? That's the type of uh, disruption you will take. And that, again, helps in food and beverage category are huge. Because many a times, these quick comm services are for immediate needs on food and beverage. Yes, you will have some top-up items, but food and beverage is a critical part. Again, that helps process food industry. Um, and the third part is digital. Uh -huh. How many of us still watch 90% of our time on television? Very few. Okay, we are traveling, we are in trains, we are in buses. Um, in Mumbai trains, I keep, sometimes I travel, people are constantly on the phone. I'm not saying that's a great idea, but you are entertaining yourself. And hence, digital becomes a key. And reaching out to consumers in a sharp manner and talking to the needs of that consumer and addressing your products becomes a lot more interesting and a huge opportunity. Again, going back to driving processed food industry and the opportunity for food and beverage players and other companies. So those are the three highlights the way I see it, but uh, yeah, thank you. I certainly agree with you that uh, things like quick commerce combined with digital payments, India has certainly done wonders where you know other countries couldn't even catch up. And the Indian consumer is so aware and utilizing such you know, platforms, which is leading to an increased demand of products in the market. And now I move to uh, uh, Mr. Manish. Uh, Manish, if you could talk about, you know, how do you see the export potential for consumer health brands for made in India products? Because you would see for consumer health brands, you could also look at, you know, sourcing various, uh, you know, commodities that grow only in India. So how do you see the export potential of made in India brands globally? Yeah, you know, if you actually go back in the history, and I'm speaking more from a multinational company's point of view, most of the time, multinational companies used to take the innovation of West and then launch it in the East, example India. But now the concept has become more reverse innovation, right? It's no more the question of what is available there and it's getting uh, introduced into the uh, Eastern side of the world. Uh, for example, for Kenview, uh, we have Orsel brand, which I was just talking about. It's an electrolyte drink. That's the brand which is being developed in India. It's not anywhere else. And now we are tr trying to take this to other parts of the world uh, across the Kenview uh, world, right? So that's one example. The second example is like Stay Free uh, is another brand which is uh, in India. And we have many innovation on Stay Free, which are not available anywhere else in India, but now getting exported to India. For example, we just, um, uh, we were in the market uh, seven, eight months back, and we realized that the BMI or the body mass index of uh, women are different in India, uh, and it was required to have a longer uh, length napkin and a wider napkin, so they can actually sleep the whole night uh, without the worry of um, staining, right? So we just launched this and it's been a great success and now we are taking that to many other parts of India. For example, Philippines is just going to take it up uh, in short period of time, right? So everything is changing from uh, l global to uh, local to uh, global, right? And uh, other part is on the export, right? India has been a uh, manufacturing hub for uh, Kenview. And we also support many parts of the other countries in South Asia right now. And uh, we definitely see a potential to uh, uh, export beyond this. But more importantly, when you talk about export, I, I don't think so. Export is only from a point of your production or manufacturing. It's also from a point of talent. Uh, and India has become a biggest hub for talent export across the uh, global Kenview world. You will see many Indians uh, in our company, and I'm sure that's true for all of our organizations, are going abroad and taking different assignments. Uh, I mean, Jagrut, I know, has moved from uh, outside. I moved back to India 
uh, about a year back. So all of us are moving around the rest of the places. And I gave an example of uh, R&D uh, hub as well, right? R&D is a global center in Mumbai, uh, which supports uh, India as well as global uh, development for CanView. Uh, we just opened a tech and data center in Bangalore, which supports, which is basically a AI ML based uh, data center, which supports India as well as the global and it's first in Asia. So there is a lot on the export uh, is happening beyond the manufacturing export. Thank you. And now, uh, now I move to Kelnova. Uh, so Prashant ji, there was a lot, lot of uh, awareness campaign running around last year for millets. And uh, there's also been a shift of, you know, consumer demand towards consuming products that were made of millets. And I know that uh, you've also been experimenting a lot with millets and uh, using millets in your products. How do you see uh, the export potential of your products, which have, you know, millets that are, so the awareness that was created that, you know, India is the largest producer of millets, so we should be using more and more millets. So do you see a, a shift towards, you know, increase in exports of such products? Uh, very good question. I think, you know, the Indian government has done a fantastic job in terms of promoting millets. Uh, in terms of, you know, one, they've been traditional in India. so People have always understood Ragi, Jawar, that they have some benefits. Uh, I can't say that it's at the same level everywhere in the world. But there are some millets, even in the US, which are big, right? Uh, Sorghum, for example. So could we take products which are let me call it multigrain rather than you know just be specific to millets uh, because you then have a more rounded taste profile. But could you take multigrain products and could you export them from India all over the world uh, and highlight the benefits that these products have because of the uh, nature of the different kind of grains and the benefits you get it? Absolutely. And as I said, our multigrain chocos that we've recently launched in India is being considered one of the gold standard products to take that innovation to multiple other countries across the region. Uh, for sure. I think the question we have to ask ourselves is could we manify, it's not just sharing the idea, but what stops us from actually being the global food basket, right? Could we actually be exporting chocos and cornflakes and many of our other products which are available all across the world from India? Uh, and I want to spend a few moments talking about what are the things that maybe stop us from doing it. First of all, we have a lot of pros. Like I said, we make best-in-class quality products. I think thanks to a lot of efficiencies in our supply chain, uh, we also make them at the lowest cost. But that's not the cost at which it reaches the other country, right? We need a lot more FTAs. We need better shipping lines. And between the two, what starts off as, let's say, a lower cost, great quality product can still lose out to a Southeast Asia uh, because we don't have the right FTAs and the right shipping lines that some of the neighboring countries have. Uh, we do export. We export to Southeast Asia. We export a little bit, of course, within South Asia. Uh, but those are really small numbers. We don't have uh, the kind of incentives and facilities that allow us to go all the way in terms of almost taking over the supply of our products, let's say, to a country like Middle East, which usually imports from somewhere or the other. Um, and part of this we also have to introspect is, what does the Made in India brand mean uh, as far as food is concerned? So for sure, if it is for Indian diaspora and if it's Indian kind of food, they look for Made in India products because they're looking for a taste of home. But if you talk about products which are actually, you know, let's say, common products across, uh, we do have a bit of a disadvantage because there is a belief that our safety standards, our food safety standards, our quality is not world class. And I think collectively as an industry, we need to work. Uh, we need to raise the standards of suppliers and even primary converters. Because honestly, if you don't get the quality right there, no amount of secondary conversion will be able to reverse let's say, some issues or some contaminants which are coming at first case. And I know Pepsi is doing fantastic work directly with farmers. We're also doing some work with corn farmers on sustainable agriculture. And we've all got to collectively do more and more of this so that the quality, you know, the farm output is of a quality that is global standards. And that's when I think the real unlock will happen uh, from what the question that you're asking. Yeah, True. thank I you. I completely agree with that. Uh, moving to Uflex. 
And as uh, Mr. Pillai has introduced that they are an Indian multinational, which means that they, uh, their products are being exported to already uh, already many countries. So, Mr. Pillai, would you like to shed some light on, you know, which are the key countries where you've been exporting and where do you see potential in other countries where uh, maybe Indian-made products could have more potential? Uh, so, India exports a lot of flexible packaging material. This is at least one product where we beat the Chinese in terms of exporting to the to the western part of the world, mainly because of the quality and the and the regulatory compliances we have to go through. So we are in a much better position. But largely, uh, commodity packaging material, uh, general products. But there are a few interesting products which we export. I'll give you a small example. India exports something like uh, 50 lakh metric tons of basmati rice to the Middle East. And the, the consumption pattern in the Middle East is very different than India. So if you buy a 5 kg or 10 kg rice, we empty it in a dibba and we, we consume it. But in this part of the world, they want to retain it uh, as it is. So the packaging has to provide ease of dispensation. So we provide a slider zipper bag. And providing a slider zipper bag on a 10 kg or a 20 kg rice is challenging. It's ultimately plastic. So these are the areas, uh, for example, in um, Europe, they use a lot of refill packs, you know, the spouted pouches. So uh, India, in totality, produces something like 5 million spout pouches in a month. And the whole of Europe consumes more than 5 million uh, spout pouches. So we are very strong in these areas. Uh, refill packs are for, for large uh, consumption packs. So India primarily has a low unit pack consumption more like a less 10 rupees price point or a 5 rupees pack sells more than uh, maybe a 2 liter shampoo or a 1 liter uh, detergent. Uh, one interesting product which comes to my mind is the actively modified atmospheric packaging. So India produces uh, good exotic uh, tropical fruits, you know, and we are not able to export these fruits because of the very short shelf life. Uh, for example, mango, uh, we have lychee, we have chiku, we have pomegranates. Uh, you will all be surprised to know that Indian kiwi is the best in the world. You know, we, are, we don't even know about it because uh, the shelf life is very less and we don't get it because it's uh, produced in Arunachal. So the Ministry of Agriculture had approached us saying that we are in, a, in a 5 trillion economy which we are targeting, we need a very substantial large chunk of exports coming out from our agro produce. So they gave us three products, chiku, uh, lychee, Shahi lychee in Muzaffar Nagar, and uh, kiwi from Arunachal. So the problem is that um, <clears throat> when the fruit is on, on, on the tree, on the vegetation, it behaves like uh, vegetation. It, it uh, inhales carbon dioxide and exhales oxygen. So it does not get ripened very quickly on, when it is on the tree. The moment you harvest it, the moment you pluck it out, it behaves like human being. You know, it, it, it needs oxygen to ripen. And the cycle time is very very small. It starts ripening on the sixth day and it's just finished off in eighth day. You start losing the texture and the taste. So how do you develop a packaging material uh, which can extend the shelf life? So we took it up as a challenge. So we purchased some respirometers. We wanted to find out how much does the fruit respirate? You know, how much does it exhale uh, carbon dioxide and how much does it inhale oxygen? So we have readings for kiwi and the, the chiku and the, the shahi lychee. And uh, we could, um, if you try to pack it in a hermetically sealed pack, uh, it will go anaerobic. It will not ripen. It will lose its taste and texture. If you make it too aerobic, it will ripen very fast and you know, all the sugar will be leached, leached out. So we developed a packaging material which uh, provides the right amount of natural respiration to the product, thereby increasing the shelf life. You'll be happy to know we can create a shelf life of 14 days for lychee, which was earlier four, four days. We can export it from here to Dubai by sea. Uh, we are able to uh, increase the shelf life of kiwi by 21 days. Uh, the, the Nagpur chili is very, very exotic chili. It, uh, if you pack a 3 kg chili, you know, it will become 2.7 kg in like four days because it loses water. So we are able to export chili, we are able to export pomegranate. So this is one product. We talk about innovation. Uh, India has done very well. And uh, very soon we will be exporting this fresh produce to at least Dubai. Uh, I think Ministry of Agriculture is uh, tying up with Lulu's for all these uh, exotic products. And this packaging comes handy. So there are many such things which uh, 
uh, are consumed uh, abundantly in the uh, western part of the world, which we have to develop here uh, in India. Thank you so much. And I think uh, all of us have uh, gained great insights into you know, how this sector has been contributing greatly to, in terms of innovation, investment, and exports. And it is not that easy, like Himanji was explaining, nothing uh, of such innovation is easy. Like we see in our homes that, you know, making a basin could be very easy. But the challenges are unique. A lot of innovation is required and so is a lot of investment is required. And so a lot of uh, these great names who are sitting here have done this and proven that, you know, companies can do this in India and grow in India. As we uh, come to the end of this discussion, I would like to extend my gratitude to our esteemed panelists from PepsiCo, ITC, Kenview, Uflex, and Kelanova for sharing their valuable insights and experiences. Your contributions have shed light on not just the current landscape, but also the potential of this sector. As we come to the end of this discussion, I would like to thank you all once again for your participation. And I look forward for seeing a positive impact that we can create together in the FMCG landscape in the country. Thank you so much. Sure. intergenerational nutritional deficiency which passes on from expecting mothers to newborn children, stunted growth. The entire story of demographic dividend, whatever we are talking about, if the growing generation is not healthy, you know, and I am talking about masses, not the urban elite, but the rural masses, it will be wasted. I am aware of a societal impact project that we have partnered with, and I'm proud to say that ITC, Ashurbad Char Kadam We, Himanta, uh, <coughs> worked last year, this year, we have trained 60,000 rural women who are nano entrepreneurs in food products on food safety, hygiene, and training, sponsored by ITC as a socially responsible project. Please, to the leaders, Look at the other aspect of the society, the real Bharat. And I think, you know, PepsiCo working with farmers, FPOs, we as a sector skill council are available for social impact projects, for your innovation, what you do in terms of standards, qualification packs, training programs. We are there to partner with our people. That has been my pitch. And, you know, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you. 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 Thank you.